chapter 2, Paul is, is, uh, starts off by saying, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship in the Spirit, any bells of mercy, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. That's what I'm looking at, the mind of Christ. Having the mind of Christ, says here in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. That's my first point, made himself. I was looking at these points. He made himself of no reputation. You know, that's... As it says in the Word of God, he was in the form of God. You know, the thing about the Lord Jesus Christ, no one could take away from who he was. You see, people speak about, sometimes you maybe hear people saying that when Jesus came into this world, that he emptied himself of his glory. And true, he had the glory of heaven, but Jesus couldn't be anyone other than God. He can never be lesser, lesser God, and he could never be more. There's no one greater than God. So you can't take away from the person of Jesus Christ. Even in his humanity, you, he couldn't take away from who he was. Even that humanity couldn't detract from who he was as the divine person. And yet, he made himself of no reputation. He actually done that of his own mind. He, he made himself of no reputation. It says in uh, Isaiah chapter 53, you see today we live in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where people's lives are being affected by this virus that's all over the world today. And because of that, People's lives, their jobs, their situation, their, the things that are happening in their life, whether they don't know whether their jobs are going to be secure, their, their families, all the situations that they, that they live in, but no, matter, no matter what background they're from, it's affecting everybody. And that ultimately is having effect on people's minds. Even in the Christian church, people's minds are being affected by the uncertainties of these things. You know what should characterize us as the people of God this very day? That we should be rooted and grounded in God's love and his truth. Because only by that, only having that, something that's a reality in your life and in and being guided by the spirit of your mind that you're able to be steadfast, unmovable, and always moving in the, in, the, in the will of God and seeking to do God's will. That's why today we're under, even the Christians are under so much attack by the world, by everything that's happening around about us. Should we do this? Should we do that? What should we do here? What should we do there? You know, brothers and sisters, you know what we should do? Seek to have the mind of Christ. Seek to have the mind of Christ. It says here, in that passage that I read, that you have to think of others before yourself. You know, sometimes people will say, well, we're under persecution. We're not allowed to sing. We're not allowed. And by the way, do you think I don't like, do you think I enjoy not being able to sing in the house of God? That I can't have a freedom in the house of God that I, I wish I did have? I wish I could sing this morning in the house of God. I wish we could take these masks off. I wish we could do all of these things. But you know what we've got, we've got to do in the midst of all of this? Think about others. We have to regard others. We've got to think about those who are more vulnerable than ourselves. Quite frankly, somebody puts a, if somebody puts a hand out to me to shake my hand, you know something? I'm going to shake the hand. I'm not going to go, oh, 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 will I do that or will I not? If somebody wants to put a hand out to me, I'll shake the hand. Because you know, God's not a God of fear. We've not to have a mind of fear today. You know, a lot of people are in fear. Fear because of the situation we're in. Fear in many things. Fear in many different ways. But the Word of God tells us we've not to have that. 
type of those type of thoughts that we have to trust God. If somebody says to me, uh, "Yes, we've got to abide by regulations. Yes, we've got to. Yes, yes, we've got to think about others. We've got to think about those who are in situations with health problems, different things." Yeah, but you know, today I, it was. I can't remember where it was, but somebody. <laughs> I don't know if it was in the church or somewhere outside. Somebody reached out and t- took my hand and shook my hand. I, th- I can't remember if it was a job or whatever it is. But you see, sometimes we can... I know we've got rules and regulations. Sometimes we can be put into a situation where we can't be free in the love of God. You see, I know that, I know that there's many people who have got different underlying problems, illnesses, sicknesses, different things. That's why we wear masks in the church. That's why we don't do certain things that we might do out in the world because we know that we're in close proximity with people who have different problems, health problems. Different. That's even why people aren't even in the church today, probably, because there's underlying fears that they might even pick up something or they might be used to spread something, whatever it might be. And that's the environment we are living in today. It's an environment of fear and uncertainty. But you know something? We've not to be fearful as the people of God. God's not given us the spirit, the spirit of bondage again to fear. God's given us the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So don't let this situation put you into a spirit of fear. Remember, you're kings and priests unto God. You've not to be fearful of these things. Yes, we have to abide by rules and right. Yes, yes, we have to abide. We have to abide by the powers that be, yes. But don't let that don't let that spirit that's abroad today come in and suppress your freedom in Christ, your liberty in Christ, because it will try to do that. And there's no doubt. See, we've got to get the balance in all of these things. We've not to let the fear of this world come in and suppress our liberty in Christ Jesus. That's not to say that we've just to come in and do what we want in the house of God. Obviously, that's not what we're saying. We've got to get the balance right. It's always the balance, isn't it? That's, the, that's always the difficult but getting the balance right. But Christ had the balance right, didn't he? You know, it says, in, as I said, in Isaiah chapter 53, I'll read this for you. He made himself of no reputation. So I'm not fearful today. I'm not fearful. Are you fearful of this world? Are you fearful of the things of this world? I'm not fearing this world. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, yes, I care about the situation spiritually of this nation, but I'm not fearful. I'm not fearful of this virus. I'm not fearful of whatever. If the Lord wants to take me home, the Lord can take me home. I'm not, you see, I didn't, I didn't save myself. I've got a sovereign God who has who, who is purposed in my life and planned the day that he'll take me home. And nothing will take me home before God. Says he says I'm coming home, so I don't I don't live my life according to oh, what about that and what about that and oh you worrying about this and different things and all the different conspiracy things that that you see on the internet, brothers and sisters. We've not to get in that line. You know what we've to do trust God's word, trust what the Lord says. Isaiah 53, it says, "All we like sheep have gone astray; we have turned every one to his own way." And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Wow. Made himself of no reputation. Eh? What a saviour. First Peter says, First Peter chapter uh, 2 and verse 21. Just read this verse to you. I'll go through these points quite quickly because I know we've got the Lord's Supper after this. First Peter chapter 2, verses 21. For even hereunto you were called because Christ also thought, suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self 
bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. What a saviour. Why did he do all of that? Why? It says over in Hebrews chapter 10, just give you this quickly. Why did he do all of this? Why did he have to come and do all of this? Hebrews chapter 10. It says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image, can never of those sacrifices which they offer year by way, year continually, make the, make the comers thereunto perfect. You see, God had a perfect plan for his people. God had a perfect purpose in sending the Lord Jesus Christ, and God had a perfect plan for his people. You know why? Because God has a perfect plan for you and I. You see, we might think sometimes that, oh, that we might have, maybe, maybe, maybe sometimes it grieves you that your life maybe hasn't been a better life for Jesus. Maybe you've not lived up to the full potential of your Christian life. You know something? See, when you get to heaven, God's going to show you something that you could never have attained to when he shows you Christ glorified. And you know something? The Word of God says, when we see him as he is, we'll be like him. You see, our picture of what it is to be a Christian, right? The Word of God gives us that, that beautiful pattern, that beautiful picture. But see, when we see him as he is, we're going to see it in all its glory, in all its reality. And it's going to be perfect beyond anything we can imagine. So don't worry. I'm not saying don't, don't just live your life anyway. We know that's, that's not the Christian life. We have to live holy lives. We have to have an attitude of prayer, an attitude of desire for the Word of God. That comes without saying. If you don't have that, if there's no holiness in our lives, if there's no desire to know God's Word, there's no desire for these things. We're not Christians. Because Paul says we're new creatures. We've got whole new desires now. Before we had desires for the world. We had desires, the same desires our friends had. People we worked beside, we wanted to go out and enjoy ourselves at the weekend, go to parties, do, do all the things that they did. You know, how you're, you know if you're a Christian today, you don't have those desires now. You want to be with the people of God. You want to be where the Holy Spirit is moving. You want to hear beautiful things. You want to hear nice things. You don't want to hear cursing and swearing. You don't want an environment where the Lord's name has been blasphemed. You don't want to be in that environment. You want to be in a pure and a beautiful environment where there's prayer, where there's this, the Holy Spirit's moving. That's your new life. That's your new life. Because we've got a new nature. And in that new nature, we feel at home. In that atmosphere. Do you feel that? Do you, do you still feel comfortable, maybe, to a certain extent, in an atmosphere of this world? Well, John says in his epistle, the love of the world isn't a lot, is it, it's contrary to the love of the Father. If you love the world, you don't have the love of the Father in you. But Jesus came, came to, why? Came to, came to fulfill the will of God. Then said I, verse 7. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings, and sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Hallelujah. That's where we are if we are Christians this morning. We are not under the law, the old covenant. We're under the new covenant of grace through Jesus Christ. And that's why he came. That's why he made himself of no reputation. And that's why we have to not consider ourselves anything in this world. We have to esteem others greater than ourselves. That's, that was the spirit of Christ. And see, when you do that and you have that attitude, you'll not be caustic or critical of anyone. 
You'll not be thinking less of anyone. You'll be praying if you see, see a fault. If you see a fault in me, pray for me. Because I've got lots of them. No, that means you'll be busy praying. No, but see if you genuinely see a fault in each other. We have to pray for each other. We have to pray. Saying, Lord, help that sister. Help that brother in that situation. Help them to get through that. That's Christianity. That's the body. That's what the body, that's, it's good and it's encouraging to see the people of God on Zoom praying for each other. Praying for healings. Praying that God will undertake and help brothers and sisters in time of need. But you know something? We all need prayer. Every single one of us. No matter who we are, we all need prayer. Because we, we're, we're all under the attacks. We're all under the influence at the times of this world and the things of this world. You know, the reason Jesus made himself of no reputation was that God could show us mercy. He had to take upon him our judgment so that God could be merciful to us. You know, you'll see this. You'll see this, the beautiful passage in John at John chapter 8. Remember the, the woman who in adultery who was taken before the Lord Jesus? You'll get it in John chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery and in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what say thou, sayest thou? What do you say, Lord? What do you say, Lord Jesus? What do you say, Jesus? What do you say? What do you think? Do you think she should be stoned? What do you think? Now that's what the law says. Now Moses and the law commanded that such should be stoned, but what says thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to have an uh, opportunity to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote in the ground, as though he heard them not. You know, when I look at that passage, I look at that, and that ties up with what I've just read in in, Matthew, in the Hebrews chapter ten. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. He, he, by stooping down, by humbling himself, he fulfills the law to remove the law. That's exactly what happened in this situation. This they said, tempting him, that he might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. And with his finger wrote in the ground, see, it is written of me to do thy will. That's what Jesus could have been writing in this. It is written of me to do thy will, O oh God. To come down, to, to humble myself, come down, and to fulfill your will. That the first, as I read in Hebrews 10, might be removed, the law. And it, look, it says in verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin, let him cast the stone first at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone. See what happened? He stooped down to fulfill the law so he could remove, so he could remove all the accusations against this woman. And it goes on to say, that's true, that was, that was in his humanity, he came to fulfill the law. And then it says, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. What was that? That's when he died on the cross. And he was right and rose again the third day, typically, that he might establish the second. That he might bring in mercy and grace. See this? It's a beautiful picture. And that's the way we have to be. We have to have that same attitude. See, the law, the law accuses us. But the Spirit of Christ, what does it do? It shows us mercy. And through him, grace comes. And grace comes into our life. Just like this woman. Uh, and it says, And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. 
And when Jesus had lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I go and sin no more. That's why Jesus came. That's the mind that we've to have. We've not to have the mind of bringing accusations up against each other, or even in the world. We have to remember that we're only in the position we're in because of grace through the Lord. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful mind, isn't it? To have that mind, not to be critical of each other, but to realize that we were in the same place. We were in the same place of condemnation. And it was only because Jesus stooped down, fulfilled the law and removed it for us, that he could then rise again and, re and ultimately remove the law, satisfy the law that he might remove the law completely from our lives, that we know being, being no longer under the law, but under grace. Very quickly on to the next point. I, you know, Paul says, that's to do with, that's why Jesus made himself of no reputation. See what he did? He opened up the heart of God. You see, you see, in that passage that says, do you, ever, do you know, ever wonder why it says in that passage in Philippians? I'm sure you know this. Why does it say in that passage in Philippians? I'll read it again for you. That, he, that God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and things in the earth and things under That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. You see, it's all about the Father's glory, brothers and sisters. You were saved for the Father's glory. I was saved for the Father's glory. It's not for our glory. It's His glory. Him that He gets all the glory because it was our Father that planned it all. And it's our Father that purposed it all and planned it all in Christ before the foundation of the world. Philippians chapter 3 this is Paul. This is the next letter. I for I, Paul. Remember what Paul says? You know, this is Paul speaking about his fleshy confidence. He says, there was a day when I was confident in myself. I was confident in who I was, Paul saying. And you'll know, you know these passages. Because I'll read it from, though I might have also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul says, see if anyone was trusting to the flesh to bring glory to God, to please God, it was me. That's what Paul says. I was a proud man. I was proud. And I thought I was doing the will of God. He goes on to say, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. But what things were gained to me, I counted loss. Yea, I count all things, doubtless I count all things, lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. And then what does Paul say? You see, Paul was a proud man. Paul thought he was doing the will of God until one day God had a dealing with him. Sometimes we can think, you know, sometimes you've heard that people can come under the can come under the doctrines of grace and it can puff their mind up, can puff them up thinking they're, they're this, they're that, and the next thing. Just like Israel thought, we are the people, we are God's people. We are the people. We can, you know, we are, we are specially favored by God. And that's what can happen to us at times when we come under the ministry of the doctrines of grace and it speaks about how God chose us in Christ, and we've been specially favoured by God. But sometimes that can be, that can be a, bring us into a, a situation where we, we become legal in certain things, and we start to judge others by saying, well, you know who I am, don't you? I'm one of the chosen. But who are you? You know, Paul was like that as a Jew. Paul was like that. He thought he was something special until God had to deal with him. We've got to get the balance in all of these things in my life. These are the things that we have to realize. That we're not anything, that we're not anything great of ourselves. We're only here today because of the grace of God. We're only here saved because of God's grace. 
that Paul thought he was something special. But you know, God had a dealing with him. And it says in Galatians chapter 2, you know what happened to Paul? Galatians 2, 18 to 21. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Here's this I. Paul started off with I. He was all, all concerned about his own person, his own ego and his flesh. But God had to deal with that. And God had to show him, Paul, that's a fleshy ego you've got. That's a fleshy pride you've got. Yes, yes, you were brought up as a, a Jew, a Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, but that's not what, that's not what I want. You might, you might think that's what's going to stand you in good stead. One day when you stand before me, a righteous and a holy God, no. I've got to show you, I've got to kill that, I've got to kill that pride, I've got to crush that. I've got to crush that ego and show you, you're only something through, through God, you're only something through me. God says, God had to show him that, and he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, see, Paul had a new discovery of what God's purpose and plan for his life was. And you know something, brothers and sisters, sometimes we need to look at a fresh at our lives. What is God's purpose and plan for your life, for you to be Christ-like? To have the mind of Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, in verse 16, he speaks about the natural man receiving not the things of the Spirit, and that's true. They don't, they don't understand the gospel. God's got to show us what these things mean. And God's got to show the, the importance of them. But then he ends it by saying, but we as the people of God have the mind of Christ. We know what God's doing. We know God's plan. We know God's purpose. We know what it's, this is all about. And it goes on to say, his confidence is in Christ now. Look at... Look at uh, Look at Galatians chapter uh, 2 again in verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul realized he had a new life. Galatians, uh, sorry, not Galatians, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. Look, let's look at that very quickly. You know, our life's not to be a life of faith. It's to be a life of faith towards God. A life of love towards the brethren. Love towards our enemies. Even Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 3, Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. You know, the last time I spoke, I spoke from Psalm 45. And it spoke about, Psalm 45 speaks about how the king, the bridegroom would come. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's coming to win his bride. He's coming to win his bride. That's what Jesus did at Calvary. Jesus came to win us through his life, death, and resurrection. You realize that? He came to win us. Pluck us out of the hands of the powers of darkness and redeem us and redeem us to himself. And that's, that's what this picture speaks about. But it goes on to say, who are the recipients of this? It says in verse 10, Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear and forget thine own people and thy father's house. You know, that's quite a difficult thing to do. In fact, it's... I know that some people in their relationships that when something happens in a family relationship, they're totally ostracized. Remember years ago, people in the Catholic church who were Catholics married a Protestant, married outside the faith, married outside the, the, the Catholic church. Some of them are ostracized, ostracized by their families. Totally put out, don't come here again. You've married, a, you've married someone outside the, the Catholic church. These things happened quite a, quite a lot. A number of years ago, but today, it's a totally different picture. But in them days, people were really strong in these things. And they were ostracized. You know something? You know what God says? See, when you become a Christian, set your affections on things above. Because you know what? 
You will be ostracized by this world. That will come. Forget your, forget your natural upbringing. Forget your previous life. And concentrate on the new life that you have. Because it's all fading. My relationship with my wife's going to fade one day. My son and my daughter, it's all going to fade. You know, I had lovely parents as a, a mother and father, Christian parents. But you know something? You might say to me, Robert, you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a, you know what? I don't think about them. You'll say, you don't think about them? No, I don't think about them in a natural way. My father, I don't think about them. I'll, I'll meet them in heaven, but I don't think about them in a natural way. Because the Holy Spirit, see, since I've become a Christian, you know what the Lord showed me? Your earthly father was only to bring you up into this world, and your earthly mother. They were only for that purpose. They, that's, that's now done away with now. They're now, they're now not your mother and father. That's all done away with. Your heavenly father is now your father. And Jerusalem above is now your mother. That takes, the Holy Spirit's got to show us these things. The Holy Spirit's got to be operating in my life to take, but I don't, I don't think about my mother and father. I don't look at pictures and say, oh, oh, and think about, oh, I wish they were still alive. I don't think about that at all. I don't know how you feel like that, feel about things like that. I don't think that way at all. Because I've got a new Heavenly Father. I've got a new mother. They were only means by which God provided to bring me into this world, my humanity. But that's all finished now. I've got a new identity now through the Lord Jesus Christ. I know sometimes we don't like these things. but flesh doesn't like these things. But we're not here to preach about the flesh. We're here to preach about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, sometimes people like to think, that's why people don't like the thought of, oh, that God chose some and didn't choose others. Oh, that's not nice. That's not nice. And what about all these people who die without having an opportunity to hear the gospel? That's not nice. That's not nice. That's not nice. That's not nice that a wee child dies in birth or even aborted and can't go to heaven. That's not nice. That's not nice. That's not nice. We don't like that. That's not nice. That's not what the Bible says. We have to think the way Christ thinks. Jesus didn't even recognize he, Mary as his mother. He said, woman, woman, what have I to do with thee? Jesus didn't associate himself in an earthly way at all because he was operating in the spirit. That might not sound nice to you this morning, but you know something? Maybe we need a change of thought. Maybe we need a change. But you know something? My, I've got a heavenly father and a heavenly mother. You know something? Nothing will separate me from their love. Jerusalem above and God my father. Very quickly. In, you know, it says, I need to pass on very quickly. Yeah, sometimes we don't like that. That's, that's how people see people who are grounded in this world. Don't like the doctrines of grace. They don't like when we say Christ, uh, Christmas is a pagan festival. Ah, but I like my Christmas. I like this, I like that, I like, my, I like my wee celebrate, I like my wee stars, I like my wee jingly things, I like doing that. I don't want to come to a church that doesn't celebrate Christmas. I don't like that. Come on, why don't you celebrate this? Why don't you celebrate that? Brothers and sisters, it's all of this world. It's nothing to do with Jerusalem above. It's nothing to do with heaven. It's nothing to do with our new, our new identity in Christ. It's nothing to do with it whatsoever. Two different worlds. That's this world. We belong to another world, brothers and sisters. I've never ever, since I came to this church, remember my sister, the first time I came to this church, the pastor was preaching about Christmas, about pagan festivals and all the rest of it. And I went to my sister's for my lunch. My lunch, she was having a, a Christmas uh, meal thing. And I remember my sister saying to me, my, my twin sister saying, where are you going, Robert? Where are you going? I said, I'm going to church. Hey, what? You have the Christmas. I says, Eileen, come on. I says, it's all, that's pagan. I says, I don't mind coming and having a bit of fellowship, but I'm not going to, I'm not here to put the Lord aside so I can have some Christmas feast, feast with you. And she was upset. She was crying and uh, I was actually upset. But you know something? See, to, see, to, see to take a stand on these things, it's not, it's not always easy. 
It's not always easy. By the way, my, my wife will put up a Christmas tree in her house. And sometimes she'll say, Are you praying against that? That tree's fell down twice a day. Have you done this? Have you done that? But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fault my wife and say, right, you know what I've told you what that is. You know what it is. So you've got to get the balance and all this. You can't go, yeah, I remember meeting some brethren guys up in East Cobride one time when we were out handing tracks in the, out in East Cobride town centre. And they said, they, they took a very illegal position with regard to a lot of things. <clears throat> and if their wife wasn't a child of God, they sat at a different table. They didn't allow them to sit at the same table as them. Brothers and sisters, that's not Christianity. Although they couldn't see that, they couldn't, I'm not going to say, oh, Sandra, I can't sit at the same table with you. You need to sit in the corner, I need to sit in the corner, or I need to sit in a different room. You know something, brothers and sisters, it's getting the balance in it all. It's getting it all, oh, it's getting the balance. What did Christ do? He went among sinners. He went among people. It's having the spirit of Christ. It's having that attitude towards those who need to know the truth, who need to, need to see the love of God. In a, re, in, a, in a life, in a reality, in a real situation. Not just sitting in the church saying we love you and then going outside and then criticizing people. No. It's having that right attitude and that right, and that right balance in our Christian lives. Very quickly. N. M for made himself, I for Paul, and M for name of God the Father. You see, because you know why? He glorified the name of God the Father when he made himself of no reputation. Because when he went to, when he went, it says in Romans chapter 9, see, even today people rail against the doctrines of grace and they don't like it because it doesn't tie right with their flesh the way they think, the way they think it should go. It's nothing to do with the way they think it should go. But they, they're the ones that, they're the authors of the, the Word of God and they want to pull back suit and say, I don't like that, let's change it. Brothers and sisters, it's very obvious. That's the flesh. That's not the Spirit. That's not the Spirit of Christ. It says here, why did Jesus glorify the, God the Father? Here it's here. For the children being not yet born, verse 11, neither having done any good or evil that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Jesus sought to glorify God his Father and humbling himself became obedient unto death that God the Father might be glorified in what? I told you this before, so many times, when you read in the Word of God of the Father and how the, Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, Father, let, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus in his flesh, and his Jewish flesh, and his being the son of David, had a will in his flesh that was contrary to his heavenly Father's will. Not in, his, not in his spirit, in his flesh. That's why he said, Father, if it be possible. But you see what Jesus did? He bowed to his Father's will. And you and I have to bow to our Father's will. That's what he did when he gave himself. The name of God, the Father. His purpose was an, an election that he, would, he had chosen a people to save them, regardless of the life they lived, regardless of their sinful ways. He would give them, he would give them the Lord Jesus Christ to die on their behalf. Look at Matthew 26 and 39 very quickly. I'm just going to finish in a few moments. Matthew 26 and 39. And he went, this is the Lord Jesus, a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And you know what happened? He prayed again in verse 42, and he went away again the second time and prayed, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Then he prayed again, remember? Three times he prayed. 
And each time he went to the disciples, they were sleeping. That was God's answer to him. They don't know what's happening. They don't know. Remember? And Jesus knew no matter how he felt, he was going to have to go through this. You'll get that also over in Luke chapter uh, 2 and 39. Exact same prayers. And you know what happened? God had to send him an angel to strengthen him. You see, Jesus in his humanity had to be strengthened. Had to be strengthened to take that cup. Wow. What a saviour, eh? He had to be, he had to know what it was to have the weakness of his flesh to be strengthened by an angel so that we can also, see, when we in times of trial and problems, we also can have an angel to come and strengthen us. Because they're, they're ministering spirits to the ears of salvation, as you know. I don't have time to look at other verses I've got written down here. John, John 17, very quickly, John 17. This is Jesus' prayer. Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that the Son may also glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou has said, look at verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. Who's he talking to, the Father? I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. What is, what, what is it to be kept in the Father's name? To be kept in the true purpose that, as to why Jesus came. To reveal to them the true plan and true purpose of the Father from all eternity. That he, when he chose us in Christ. And it's now revealed to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is to know the name of the Father. To know his name, to know his purpose and his plan for our lives. And when you know it in your heart, that's why you cry out. That's when you cry, Abba Father. Because now you know the name is now written in your heart through the Holy Spirit. And you know that God's your Father. You don't need anybody to tell you that God's your Father. You know you've got the witness of the Spirit within you that God is your Father. The name is now written in your heart. And very, la very last point, I, N for made himself, I for I Paul, N for name of God the Father glorified through Christ, and D for die. What have we to do, brothers and sisters? How does all this work out? How does it all come to pass? Well, you know what we have to do? We have to die to our old man. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, but ye have not so learned Christ, brothers and sisters. If you've been in Zion Baptist Church for a number of years, You've not learned Christ the way others have learned Christ some, in maybe other churches. You've learned Christ. You've been taught of God. You know the truth. If so, be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, Paul was prepared to die for his people, for the people of God. And he did, ultimately. You know, Paul in, Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, I meant to mention this. It says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, Lord. Wow, what's so, what's so astounding about that? That statement, I, Paul, am a minister of God to you Gentiles. What's so astounding about that? The Gentiles, as far as Paul was concerned, were his enemies. 
But now Paul was a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ for the Gentiles. He was prepared to be a prisoner there and ultimately to die that the gospel would go to the Gentiles. To go. And you know something? See, when I think about the mind of Christ in these passages, you know something? Wow. You know what it is to have the mind of Christ? You're prepared to die. You're prepared to die for each other. You're prepared to die for your fellow brother and sister in Christ. That's what, it, uh, that's what it is to have the mind of Christ. Put your hand up if you've got the mind of Christ and you know you're prepared to die for your brothers and sisters today. Can any of us put my hand up? You know something, brothers and sisters? It's possible that we could have that. That we could have the mind of Christ and be prepared to die for each other. Be prepared to put ourselves on the line for each other. That's what it is to have the mind of Christ. Because that's what Christ did. He put himself on the line for his enemies. And Paul also did the same. How are we How are we faring today? Are we prepared to put ourselves on the line for each other? Are we prepared to dedicate ourselves in, in a time of prayer for each other? Seek, seek each other's well-being? Because if we don't, we don't have the mind of Christ. If we don't, we don't have... That in fact, I was just I was just going to read the very very last few verses. I'm very conscious of the time. That clock says ten to and I've got eighteen uh, eighteen minutes to. I'm very conscious of the time. Look what it says in the last few verses of Ephesians chapter four. Wherefore put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the things which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, that's to each other and to others. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you were sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. We have to be a forgiving people. We have to be uh, kind, tender-hearted. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's what it is to have the mind of Christ. May God bless you.